So, so to articulate what we've done so far, we've published reports looking at PM 2.5 diesel exhaust particles, and we published a, another report looking at cigarette smoke. With the cigarette smoke particles, that was purely in the context of ceramides, forced mitochondrial fission, and insulin resistance, and the cigarette smoke did all of those things. The newer paper that we published about a year or two ago was, I think, the first to find that if you just have increased diesel exhaust particles, even when we calorie clamped these, we pair fed these animals, and the animals that were inhaling more of the diesel particles at physiological levels, like at a level that a human could be exposed to, they had much fatter fat cells. So they had much more adipocyte hypertrophy, um, which accounted for a higher body fat mass, even though they were eating the exact same amount of calories. Again, we pair fed them. We only let them eat as much calories as the other group was eating, and they still had more fat. So it does suggest that there are non-nutritive stimuli. You'd mentioned some others. We've not done work on microplastics or the plasticizers, those like diethylstilbestrol and, and BPA, but those also have been shown to promote greater fat expansion in the absence of calorie changes. That's another reason why I, I think that it's, we don't do ourselves any favors when we only have a calorie centric view of obesity, because there are more variables that come into play here. Now, to answer that last part of your question, which is to what degree should the average person be worried about that? I, it pains me to say this because it's my own work. I think that's a, that's a lower tier concern. It's also one that some people may not literally be able to do anything about. We have just what's preliminary data now, when we look at the superheated particles, which is what you're inhaling, we've, we're finding, we haven't published this yet, so this is unpublished. My master's student, is, this is her thesis project right now, so the data is forthcoming. But the early data suggests that it's, it actually, at, at a relatively controlled um, dose, matching it for the cigarette smoke dose that we used previously, it's worse. So with now, I can't speak to the consequences of the tumorigenesis effects, like maybe the person's going to have slightly better outcomes with cancer. But when we're looking at forced, the outcome we've measured so far is mitochondrial um, outcomes, looking at the degree to which the mitochondria can take in oxygen and convert it to ATP, rather than the oxygen being converted into superoxide radical, it's worse with the superheated particles from the vaping than from the cigarette smoke. Do you think this is coming down to nicotine or I don't know. other things in the vape? Oh. I don't know. So we have just the whole animal data so far. And then the next step will be isolating individual particles to try to find out, all right, which culprit, if one culprit, is more uh, to blame with regards to the e-cig exposure versus the cigarette. Because it is different chemicals. There's a, there's a whole host of commonly prescribed medications out there from lipid lowering medications like statins yep. to antidepressants and other neuropsychiatric, yeah. you know, disorders and medications that help with those disorders. What, 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 is that something to be concerned about? Oh, for sure. Yeah, it absolutely is. And I'll just mention one that you just mentioned, which is statins, just because of how common they are. So there's no evidence that statins that I'm aware of are going to create weight gain, but there are metabolic consequences to messing with cholesterol Lest people forget, cholesterol is a precursor to an essential component of the electron transport system. And so it's no surprise that if people are waging war on cholesterol synthesis, the mitochondria may suffer. And in women, uh, middle-aged and older women have a 50% greater risk of developing type 2 diabetes when they get on a statin. That's a meaningful increased risk. Women appear to be much more susceptible to the consequences of statins, metabolic consequences of statins, not to mention the increased risk of Alzheimer's and even certain cancers that come with statins. Now, I'm not intending to sound like I don't think there's a, ever a place for statins, but I do think they're over-prescribed. Now, more heavily metabolic, any steroid uh, that's been prescribed to control inflammation is going to be deeply problematic for weight gain. So if a person has an autoimmune disease or a chronic inflammatory condition and the clinician has prescribed a corticosteroid, they're going to gain weight very, very quickly because that starts to play on that stress pathway where the more cortisol is that pathway is being activated, which is what that's doing, the more you're going to make the body insulin resistant, higher insulin promotes fat gain. And then just for the sake of time, perhaps I just mentioned the atypical antipsychotics. The Any drug that ends with an Apine, 
um, at the end of it, the suffix being A-P-I-N-E is generally going to promote weight gain. That's probably through a central insulin resistance of the hypothalamus. When the hypothalamus becomes insulin resistant, you have a reduced satiety signal and the person's just going to start eating more.